Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 420. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Jeff Walton, and it's July 13th, 2018. It's over. Okay, you are an official survivor of an on-site journalist at General Convention 79. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. You're going to get a t-shirt that says, I survived GC 79. Um, I appreciate it. (laughs) It's just, George and I have been to many, and uh, there's just nothing like it. It's an event uh, onto itself. It deserves all the press it gets, good press and bad press. And uh, it's a great time to, to finish and talk about what really happened uh, kind of behind the scenes because uh, I, I'm sure you're well of, aware of um, some of the stuff that mm-hmm. was behind the scenes. Um, mm-hmm. I guess, well, before we get started, mm-hmm. to the viewer, it's time for you to participate. We want you to like it. We want you to share this episode. We want you to comment. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe to Anglican Unscripted. Um, looks like... My observation and mm-hmm. stuff I've read, 1979 prayer book is here to stay. I've never seen a defense, finally, of 79 uh, quite the way uh, I saw at this general convention, Jeff. Yeah, well, uh, there was a defense of it. However, the, the main thing that may have prevented uh, beginning comprehensive prayer book revision at this time is just the fact that nobody seemed to really want to revise the prayer book except for a small group of activists. Mm -hmm. Uh, There was a pretty substantial group of people who were willing to do prayer book revision, but they weren't really pushing for it, and they weren't pushing for it for the same reasons. Uh, Some folks were in favor of prayer book revision because uh, of um, reasons that were demographic or or sociological. uh, one of the quotes that uh, I thought was interesting was Bishop Shannon Johnston of Virginia, who probably was not really strongly motivated either way on this. Um, he said that when the 1979 revision took place 40 years ago, that it had some pretty significant theological motivations. You wanted to basically uh, focus on baptism, centrality of the Eucharist. Uh, so in his words, it was deeply theological. And he didn't see any of that in the conversations that were pushing prayer book revision this time around. He said instead it was uh, demographics and sociology that people were talking about. And was that really the reason that you wanted to do a prayer book revision? Was that worthwhile? And the answer in the House of Bishops, at least, was no. Well, it seemed to me, and I I think I heard this quote somebody, uh, this has been the Society for the Preservation of the 1979 Prayer Book. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, surprising to see it come to that, but yeah. Uh, this is uh, something that the people don't want to change at this time, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, surprisingly, uh, you're, you're, you're going to, uh, at least for the next triennium, this, this process to revise the prayer book isn't going to be moving forward. So they're not going to do anything to their prayer book, but mm-hmm. there's now going to be some additional you know, supplementary rights. I can't even say that today. Mm-hmm. It's Friday. Yeah. Um, they're going to add some rights. Uh, to kind of make up for it. Mm -hmm. Uh, What have you heard about that? Yeah, uh, so the idea behind some of the prayer book revision is this concept of, quote, expansive language. Mm -hmm. And what that really boils down to is gender-neutral stuff. Um, The issue is some people in the church are concerned that if you continue to use language that is, in their words, patriarchal, you're undermining the church's political positions in regards to things like the Me Too movement and wanting to uh, fight back against things in the culture that are misogynistic or that they're just unhealthy in regards to uh, the treatment or referring of, of women. Uh, but the problem with this is uh, there is um, not really enough of a justification to revise the entire prayer book over that. Uh, So what's going to happen is there will be liturgical resources which will be developed, and uh, as you and George have already talked about, there's a question of where this money is going to come from, uh, but that this substantially smaller amount of money would be required for this, and most importantly, it doesn't touch the prayer book, and diocesan bishops have the ability to decide whether or not these materials can be used in their diocese. So you might get something that is introduced by some people that is a supplemental resource with this expansive language on on gender and has a gender neutral God. 
uh, but again, doesn't really get used by most parishes in the Episcopal Church because it's not distributed in the prayer book, and most don't have congregations that are calling for this resource to be used. All right, let's talk about marriage rights. Uh, going mm -hmm. into General Convention, the hope of the House of Deputies and lots of people who belong to the House of Deputies is we can finally get um, marriage rights into the hands of those who really need it. Um, those people who are under the oppression, uh, oppression of conservative bishops. And we saw the resolutions, we saw the, you know, the back and forth, we saw the House mm -hmm. of Bishops saying, we understand where you're coming from, but you're not doing it right. So what, what's the result there? Well, uh, marriage rights will be uh, made available for everyone across the church if your parish leadership agrees to it. What this does basically is it removes the diocesan bishop from uh, being able to proscribe these rights from being used in, in their diocese. Uh, but if your vestry and your rector both agree to it, uh, which in some parishes will be the case in, within conservative dioceses, then uh, the bishop has to go and arrange for a, a neighboring diocesan bishop to oversee this process. Um, so it's a uh, it's certainly not the outcome that I would have wanted uh, because I'm a proponent of traditional marriage. Uh, but uh, the majority of the communion partner bishops who are uh, theologically conservative uh, were actually okay with this arrangement because it doesn't require a bishop to sign on the dotted line and say, I approve of this. Um, uh, however, there were others within the communion partner uh, group who were very much in oppose opposing it. Uh, Bishop Bill Love from Albany would be the, the chief example. Uh, he got up and spoke in the House of Bishops for about 10 minutes uh, against this and Wait, was given uh, they a significant him, amount of time. They gave him 10 minutes? Yeah, you were supposed to only have two minutes, but uh, they allowed him to, to have some more time. Uh, it was a very emotional appeal. Mm -hmm. And uh, he explained why he didn't feel that he could, he could move forward uh, with, with allowing uh, these rights to be used in his diocese. Um, the other communion partner bishops, uh, including uh, Greg Brewer uh, from Central Florida and uh, uh, Springfield and some others, uh, said that they were okay with this agreement uh, because it allowed for basically the bishop's uh, conscience to be protected and that the bishop wouldn't have to, to sign off on it, uh, but is basically being bypassed. Um, so I, it's, a, it, it's something, though, that was talked about significantly at this convention. And I think it's one of the reasons that prayer book revision was finally actually defeated was once the LGBT caucus groups decided that they could get their way on marriage without revising the prayer book, they weren't terribly interested in revising the prayer book anymore. At least many of them weren't. Um, so that was something that took place. Uh, I scribbled down a few quotes that I thought were interesting that your readers, I mean, your viewers might find of interest. Um, one was, uh, th this was, also tied into some of the translation issues that, that Georgia talked about earlier in the week, which is where uh, conservatives from Province 9, such as Diocese of Honduras, Bishop Lloyd Allen, uh, had expressed uh, some real misgivings about the way translation had been handled for Spanish speakers here. And he basically said it wasn't putting people on the same, uh, the, the same level and they were basically be being treated as sort of second class deputies because they weren't getting the translation that was needed. Um, there were some apologies for that that were brought about, and uh, however, it created this impression, which is probably accurate, that a lot of the Spanish-speaking deputies were not in favor of uh, the, the marriage rights uh, being made available to everybody. Well, okay, uh, I, I don't know how that can be, because I'm watching the live feed, and every Spanish speaker provided by the Episcopal Church uh, was completely in favor of this. I know. Isn't that interesting, Kevin? Uh, what happened was after you had uh, Bishop Allen and a lot of these other deputies uh, uh, express uh, their, their concern about same-sex marriage, all of a sudden uh, the folks who were responsible for uh, who showed up at the press conferences, things like that, started uh, trying to gather up Spanish speakers. Now, they weren't from Province 9, but uh, they got the Bishop of Pennsylvania, who's a Spanish speaker, to, to come and speak in favor of this. And then in one of my personal favorite moments, uh, they got a lay deputy from the Diocese of Arizona, uh, Ariana Gonzalez Bonillas, who uh, argued uh, that these marriage rights were needed. She self-identifies as bisexual, and she argued for, quote, uh, 
rights that would express, uh, should be sensuality towards both genders. Uh, so uh, that was interesting that they kind of scurried around to get uh, Spanish speakers who they felt could kind of counter this narrative that was emerging about uh, Province 9 and, and, and Spanish speakers that were, were opposed to the marriage rights. So now we're back to two genders. I just don't understand the Episcopal Church. We're supposed to, you know, understand how society has, you know, 13 different genders now, and we're supposed to be promoting that. Now we're back to two. Mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> They're not always on the same page about the uh, the various alphabet suit, that suit designations, and that's uh, uh, something that, uh, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's not consistent across the board. That's crazy. All right, so... Um, I guess the final question I have is what gender is God? Because his preferred gender, according to him, is male-ish. Um, mm-hmm. The Episcopal churches would be neutral or feminine. Uh, have they made an official decision at all? Well, uh, when they were talking about BCP revision, uh, there were basically amendments that went through that said, well, this wouldn't affect the Lord's Prayer, so you'd still have God referred to as our father. Uh, however, it was going to change references in other areas uh, where instead of referring to God as him or his, uh, you would use either awkward wordings like uh, God's dream for things rather than, than you know his. And uh, those sorts of, of things which were sort of wordy w- would have kind of gotten uh, pushed through on that. But but that, that, that's basically been removed now uh, since BCP revision isn't going to move forward at this time. The Episcopal Church doesn't have money. They, uh, uh, it does not have as much as it... it yeah, it certainly doesn't have as much as it did in, uh, in, in the previous generation. In fact, you know this because you went to Austin in mm-hmm. July because that's probably the best they could afford for a convention center. <laughs> well, it was, it, was, it, was, it was air conditioned. In fact, sometimes too much so. Uh, there were a lot of complaints yesterday in House of Deputies that uh, a lot of animated GIFs being sent around, of uh, people freezing to death uh, because they thought the air conditioning was on too high. Uh, I think this may be the reason why you see a lot of shawls among deputies at General Convention is because a lot of them are, are uh, alternating between being outside where it's incredibly hot and being inside the convention center where sometimes it was too cold for many people. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that was that was probably one of the most divisive things was how do you handle the, uh, the ch- temperature changes. That's incredible. All right. Did they announce where the next general convention is going to be yet? Uh, I, I think uh, I actually don't know where that is. I know they had talked about a resolution about the subsequent one in mm-hmm. which there were three cities that were given. Uh, but I don't know actually where the next general convention is. I, I actually should know the answer to that, but I haven't looked yet. No, I, I'm here to ask the hard, hard questions. So <laughs> basically, we've kind of revealed that uh, um, Honduras would be a good ga- uh, candidate for GAFCON. Um, now let's talk a little bit about Cuba. Cuba, the uh-huh. communist nation, and their yeah. church have decided that the Episcopal Church is going to be a great fit for them. Yeah, the Episcopal Diocese of Cuba... Uh, was part of the Episcopal Church for quite a long time, and obviously due to some significant political issues between the United States and Cuba uh, about very substantive things like missile crises mm-hmm. and uh, human rights issues, um, the, uh, the, the the Diocese of Cuba was basically separated from the Episcopal Church. And uh, this has been the case since at least the 1960s, uh, although there were some precursors to separation in the 1950s as well. Uh, but this was basically done supposedly for the purposes of protecting the Diocese of Cuba, uh, feeling that if, if it continued as part of the U.S.-based Episcopal Church, that there would be a lot of political pressure that we've brought on them from the Cuban government, which was communist and officially atheistic. Um, so this is a, a pretty significant move, though, that the, the, the Episcopal Diocese of Cuba is now going to be rejoining the Episcopal Church and was officially voted in at this general convention. Um, now, one of the things that this means, and one of the incentives for doing this, is there's a pretty big uh, amount of money that's attached to this. Uh, the Episcopal Diocese of Cuba does not have money. Right. Uh, they also have a lot of difficulty getting visas to send representatives to official meetings here in the United States. However, there will be uh, a significant amount of money in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, of thousands of dollars which will be applied towards this, this reintegration. So that was one of the things that, that was was important as an incentive for the Cuban uh, diocese to come back into the Episcopal Church. All right. 
excuse me, I'm answering my son's text. It's amazing the things I have to do on a Friday. <laughs> Just like, I think yeah. people well, realize, well, well, you know, we're not in a closed yeah. studio yeah. at all. Yeah. Um, well, while you're doing that, I'll, I'll get my water. I, I've got a, a bottle of drinking water today. Uh, I returned to D.C., and D.C. is currently under a, a water quality alert uh, for part, part of the district, uh, So, which IRD's office is in that part of the district. So they've uh, told us all to boil our water, uh, uh. which um, uh, is a interesting thing. So uh, our, our office manager kindly went out and got back a bunch of bottled waters for us so we can drink that and uh, not have the negative consequences of drinking unboiled water. Now, so you're we'll, at so the IRD offices today. You're not at the, yes. the, the Walton uh, apartment complex? Yeah, I actually live in a house in Arlington across the river. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm in the office uh, today, so I'm, I'm in the district. But this doesn't affect across the river, so those of us in Virginia don't have to boil our water. Uh, but uh, yeah. Oh, uh, another thing, I, I forgot to go and, and talk about Israel stuff. Okay, um, yeah. I'll try, uh, try, I'll, yeah. Well, as you heard George and I talk about the, uh, the House mm -hmm. of Deputies, it's basically the UN mm -hmm. of the Episcopal mm -hmm. Church. And uh, anytime they can throw Israel under the bus uh, or climate change or whatever mm -hmm. they're there to, mm -hmm. to help uh, what what, yeah. what do you got to talk about well there were about 15 different resolutions that had to do with israel at this convention out of about 500 but uh it's certainly more than any other country mm -hmm. i think there was one resolution that had to do with yemen that had to do with concerns about uh that four-year ongoing conflict which is basically a proxy conflict between saudi arabia and iran and um that that was something that was uh, interesting, but in reality, only about six of these 15 resolutions actually got agreed to by the House of Bishops and the House of Deputies. And of those, they were all basically advisory. What this means is, oh, well, we, we think this, we think that, we encourage this, we commend that, but it doesn't have a lot of influence or impact outside of the Episcopal Church. Um, so, uh, let's see, I think I scribbled down a few of these things here. Um, one of the things that, that I thought was a the Episcopal News Service uh, did, a, did a story about this earlier on Friday in which they talked about these resolutions and they said, oh, well, it's a mixed result. Well, no, it, it really wasn't a mixed result. There was one resolution that really mattered and that was calling for divestment to basically do what was called an investment screen, mm -hmm. uh, encouraging uh, executive council basically go ahead and say, well, there should be this development of this investment screen to basically divest us of, of companies that, that do business with Israel. Um, and uh, that resolution was squashed by the House of Bishops. And that's the one that really mattered. So uh, to, to go and say, oh, well, we, we, we got, you know, a mixed result because these other six passed. No, 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 no. These other six resolutions are basically things saying, oh, well, uh, you know, it's it, it's it, it's too bad that the uh, United States relocated its embassy to Jerusalem, and you know we've got some concern about that. But there aren't any dollar signs attached to these other resolutions. So realistically, most groups outside of the church aren't really that concerned about it. You will get some anti-Israel groups like Sabil that will try to cheerlead uh, the resolutions that were passed. But the reality is, they didn't get what they wanted out of this resolution, and that was divestment. Yeah. Which, um, but there it, were. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say. I mean, there's a lot of. Uh, I have an ETF that uh, has Israel investments and in, in, in mm -hmm. market, and you know that was eight percent it made last year. I mean, there's there's money to be made if you're going to invest in Israel. Yeah, and the reality is one of the reasons that the Episcopal Church and various leaders within it have been reluctant to divest from Israel is uh, they don't want to go and tie the strings, uh, should we tie the hands together, of uh, the people who are controlling the church's investments, and they want the best possible return. Right. So if they put all these screens in place and say, well, you can't invest in this, and you can't invest in this, and you can't invest in this, that's going to have a, a negative consequence, potentially, for people who have investments that, that are in, in, in uh, the clergy positions and things like that. Uh, so that was the thing, but but one of the things that I thought really cracked me up that I wrote down this quote I wanted to share was uh, there was a, a, a deputy from the Diocese of El Camino Real in Central California. Her name was Katie Dickinson. And she told uh, the Episcopal News Service that, uh, quote, it's mostly Israel's problem uh, about it, referring to a, uh, a, a uh, resolution about Gaza. 
And she said, oh, well, I guess it's also true that, you know, Hamas is also firing missiles and needs to be part of the solution. But it's mostly Israel's problem. And I was just like, wow. So, you know, it's mostly Israel's problem, except for this minor, tiny, tiny thing of someone lobbying missiles into your backyard. So that, that kind of shows you how some of these uh, deputies are are hearing and, and viewing this stuff. And uh, they, they are not really taking seriously the threats that Israel faces to its own security. So that, that, that's something I think was, is worth noting and shows that, that some people in the Episcopal Church, especially in the House of Deputies, uh, which did pass divestment, uh, even though it was later squashed by the bishops, uh, it shows that they're just really not looking at this from an objective uh, standpoint. Let's just find winners and losers here. I would say in previous conventions, House of Deputies and House of Bishops have both won one. You know, they, they both mm. came out winners, at least the last mm -hmm. 18 years. This time mm -hmm. I see a, a bigger divide. I see kind of the House of Deputies really had nothing to offer, or the mm -hmm. House of Bishops didn't want to hear it. Uh, that was certainly the case with prayer book revision, and it was certainly the case with Israel stuff. Um, sometimes it's an issue of, of time. Uh, if you've got 500 resolutions, they're just not all going to be sure. taken up. Uh, but yeah, uh, I, I think that it would be accurate to say that the, the bishops in this case in a lot of areas were were much less willing to to go as far as the House of Deputies was. And because they weren't on the same page, it meant that these resolutions were either substantially modified or just were, were canned altogether. All right. For everybody who stuck with us all the way through, I, I want to make a special announcement. Uh, Anglican Unscripted is moving to podcast format next week. Uh, we have a church who's willing to sponsor, uh, you know, paying for the, uh, the podcast site and hosting and caching and all that that's involved with that. So, whew, because, you know, the money was always the issue. I, I don't want to cost you guys too much. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Jeff Walton. And, you and you've been watching the, uh, episode 420 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs> People can love you on the show because you're just like George and just like Gavin. You get to the end and you're like, I don't know, what are we doing here? <laughs>